Hey, guy. Oh, oh, your hair is long and curly. <laughs> That's a COVID cut. <laughs> How have you been? I've been good. I've been pretty good. Yeah, how have you been, my friend? I've, I've been, I've been good. I've been quite good. Um, both of us, yeah. both of us, do things that COVID has um, has dramatically yeah. impacted. Yeah. Oh, can you give me permission to record? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'll say one. Go ahead. I got to give it to you. Hang on. Um, uh, there you go. That should do it. All right. Yeah, you're right. We do both do things that have changed. It's funny. It's, it's, you know, we had been thinking for a long time in, you know, my company, right. Of like, okay, we got to start, you know, doing stuff online. And, but I was always so resistance, resistant to it. Right. Almost for, you know, I almost didn't even want it to work online. Right. Cause I'm just, what's now i guess you could call it old school right because i wanted to do everything in person right and so doing this it forced us to put everything online and i'm really quite surprised at like how well it works huh. um uh you know you'd think you'd think something about which the whole thing is about you know a practice of relating and relationship that yeah um, it would make a huge you know a dramatic difference it would no longer be what it was yeah if you remove the in-person body but i think when you get into conversation right there's something about a conversation that as long as there's conversing there's a there's a world that it forms right and you can you can find yourself sealed in that world right and that's the relationship right that happens so i guess if you remove although it'd be interesting to look at like what is the difference though right when you remove embodiment right from, well and that's 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 what i've noticed too on there have been moments that i've been really surprised how much you can do and yeah. then also all all, almost always forced to realize the limitations, even if you can't necessarily articulate what those limitations are. Yeah. They, they, they show up, but you realize, yeah, there's a deficiency. I was just talking to someone yesterday about something that he wanted to do in his church and he wanted me involved. And I told him, I said, I would not try to relate to people at that level in a room with masks on. I, I you, you mm. know, we've got enough experience with masks now that any kind of significant relational conversation, you just, you need to see people's faces in order to recalibrate yeah. We, we, we communicate so much and we communicate more than we know. Right. So it's, 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 it's a strange year we're living in. Are you doing a lot of stuff? You, so you, are you doing a lot of the church stuff online or like, how is this affecting COVID affecting your, what you're doing? Well, we have, so because, because I have so many older people in the church, they can't, mm -hmm. you know, we our Bible studies, our small groups moved online, but many people didn't have computers, didn't have broadband. They have yeah. old computers. They might have a 10 year old computer without a camera. And I'll say, you should really get a new computer and yeah. they can afford it. Some of them can, and yeah. they won't spend the money. It's like, yeah, but because they don't yeah. see the value. And right. so we've had, we've maintained, um, We've maintained local services almost throughout. There was a brief oh. period in March and April when we paused. Oh. And then because hospitals are filling up here, we're contemplating another brief pause, maybe a few weeks. But it's oh. it's but but even so, the numbers are very small. We have a big enough room that we can easily have lots of distance. We uh -huh. ask that people wear masks, especially if they sing. Um, yeah. And we saw in that first pause that 
the toll the isolation was taking, especially on seniors that live alone, uh, was bad. And uh, even if they didn't come every week, if they had a safe-ish place to come that was better than, you know, sort of forcing them into isolation or um, some of them, most people have family members that are just sort of not wearing masks, not paying any attention to anything like that. And that tends to be the places where you'll hear the, oh, they had a family reunion and you had, you know, 10 people get infected because yeah. so, so it's yeah. all, you know, working out the details. Mm -hmm. trying to balance all the things but it's you know we do do things online and you know i just finished talking to someone who um who has been he's he's been because he had um cancer treatment he's basically been in isolation for three and a half years mm. so but and then he and i was just before this i was thinking about doing a video thinking about church and covid and thinking about just how crappy zoom and, and streaming is. And I just had this relationship, this conversation with this guy. And he said, you know, I was, I had had a bad doctor and I was hating this doctor and I was watching your church live stream and you were talking about forgiving. <laughs> I thought, okay, I'll, we'll keep the live stream. I mean, it's, it's, it's all this kind of thing. You can't get away from it. And yeah. even if it's, even if, yeah, watching online for a host of reasons is, is impoverished compared to being present mm -hmm. it's sometimes better than nothing so we'll keep yeah. doing it yeah totally yeah totally i mean it's 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 also just interesting to think about this because i mean i've been struck by just how much of how much actually does come through this form right uh about in some sense you're body for example when it works you don't it doesn't show up for you like there's a, there's a way in which you know the the context of embodiment when it works it's actually no one's embodying anything it's just working because it disappears so there's something about really interesting to kind of get how you know questions of you know what is a self who is another and how much it's how much it's in cooperation with language and there is this thing what I have heard about, right, a lot is, you know, when you meet somebody, like if somebody comes over to your house, right, there's the beginning and then there's the end. And that's, that's a very distinct thing, right? If you just think about all the rituals that, that take place when somebody comes over, right? There's the awareness of somebody coming over, there's the knock at the door, there's them coming up to the door, there's this awareness of like privacy and you're going from a public space to a private space and it's their private space and you're entering somebody to your house and there's this whole like set of implicit and explicit formalities, right? That happen in that coming into relation and, and having somebody come in and then, and then the, the series of rituals of when they leave, right? There's all, there's all these things of like, do you have your coat? Do you have the, your things? And, oh no, let me get the door. And there's a whole kind of thing that happens at the beginning and the end. And what's interesting about this medium is you just press the button, boom, it's over. Uh, yeah. Right? Yeah. And that I think is really, really quite striking. Um, for people. And it has me wonder to what degree that that those two horizons being right, being changed on the front end and the back end, like to what degree that affects actually somehow affects the the interaction or not. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. really true. That's really right. true. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't even I haven't I mean, I've done how many hundreds of these things, but I'd never mm -hmm. really thought about that and those those yeah. rituals and those traditions. Yeah. yeah. And your, your point about embodiment is true too. When you're healthy, you know, it's, it's very, um, right. your body disappears. Yeah. Um, when you're pounding a nail, the hammer disappears. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. a str we are strange creatures with strange abilities. We really oh, yeah. are. Absolutely. We really Absolutely. are. 
So what what did you 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 you, you wanted to talk about God? So I I, I now you really had my interest when you said I want to talk about God. So yeah. well, this will be interesting. Yeah. So what are you thinking about? Tell me what you want to talk about. Well, I mean, I, on some level, that's all I've ever been thinking about, right? Is God, right? And and I've noticed because of, in fact, I was just listening to your last conversation, the three way that you had with the the Owen Barfield guy, and oh, the other yeah. guy, yeah, you just, the two I really bikers. liked it. I got about halfway through and I really liked it. And actually you mentioned something about, um, you referenced something called the middle voice. There's the first voice and the middle voice and the, what, I didn't Active, quite understand. passive, and middle. middle. Greek has a middle voice. Um, you know, active is I run. Um, passive is you know the dog was run or the car was run or something like that it's it's you're the recipient of the action and i i really thought about this you know when they when uh michael um who was the barfield scholar brought this up with respect to i really thought that about this with respect to um verveke stuff because a lot of verveke stuff is very middle voice ish it's a it's um it's 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 in the middle between the active and the passive and we don't have that in english and and it's it's much more again participatory and a lot of a lot of a lot of theological blood has been shed and ink has been expended on the difference between the active and the passive with respect to us and god yeah. And and there are there are areas in which you know does prayer change God or does prayer change us? Um, does you know with Calvinism does God save us or do we save ourselves? And right. and so um, and almost you know and, and you see these strange inconsistencies. So Calvinists are supposed to, in terms of the theological tribes, are supposed to be the ones in which humanity is enormously passive and there's no agency but you find calvinists being incredibly active and activistic and exhort you know exhorting people to go to church or stop doing this or this it's like if you really believed in human passivity you wouldn't you wouldn't be saying or doing any of these things so so yeah. something's out of whack there and yeah. so yeah the middle voice and you know, it's been a while since I've studied Greek and, and paid attention to Greek grammar, except in the process. So it's, of an actual, it's actually a grammatic kind of linguistic yes. structure in Greek. The, yes. So it's like, so for example, it'd be something like there's female words and male words and male, female and neuter in Greek too. So there's, there's those three in Greek as well. Um, so there's a middle yeah, there's, voice. The, there's the middle voice. And I remember learning that in you know when i was learning greek and it's like as always when you learn a new language when you find a construction that you don't have in your own language the only way to really get a sense of it is to get into that language and yeah. you know one thing i learned in you know having to learn spanish and then live and work in spanish when i was a foreign missionary once you especially as an adult, once you learn another language and you get beyond mere translating, oh. you do sort of become a different person. And there are, there's a you, there's a you in that context that is different from you in another context. Um, you start dreaming in the other language, you know, the, the, our relationship with language is very, is very tight and very nuanced. So yeah. So these affordances in other languages are significant. And the fact of a middle voice, especially when you get into something like Barfield, mm -hmm. where everything is participatory. And, and of course, the same for um, Heidegger, of course, where, yeah. I mean, what, where we started talking about with respect to, we stop, we stop seeing Zoom and we start seeing each other. And we yeah. stop recognizing we're seeing through eyes and we focus on the other eyes. I mean, it, it's the this this thing that we are this almost you know it's uh, it's almost a trans translucent avatar that we sort of 
you know, we're sort of moving around and and then agency the the agency of this avatar very much becomes participatory so uh, mm. yeah yeah totally well i was going to ask you because since we last talked i think i don't think this was in in place when we last talked but you have now have a one of those um those servers what discord uh, server discord server right which is a community of people that are gathered roughly in being interested in the conversations that you've started here on your channel and it's uh so you have like i would imagine and then you go and do you participate in it right like you go and do question and answer and you, there's a community in which is formed a gathering around the conversations what is that like? <laughs> so the server started, you know, we started our local meetup. Yeah. And the people, a number of the people in the meetup liked it well, and you know, so well, we would have visitors coming in from other parts of the country for our local meetup, which was, which was really flattering, but our, our members said, you know, there's a lot of people who want to talk about stuff like this, like we talk about here, and they can't. What can we do for them? And this, a bunch of these are young men mostly, and so they're gamers, so they play computer. Well, let's start a Discord server. It's free. We can start it. And so we, the first time we started it, nothing happened. The second time we did, it really took off. Oh. And that's been that's been also an avenue of exploration because when you start something like this with human beings, you don't know what's going to happen. Oh. And Discord is a strange platform. You've got voice chat capacities. You've got video chat capacities. It's mostly text chat and it's free. You don't have to pay anything to sign up. You don't have to pay anything for a server. And so then what happened? Well, so Job, who I'd had a number of conversations with, was talking with a bunch of the guys in the meetup. Job sort of became the pastor of the Discord server. And this happened because we started it and then we started going to voice chat and he started doing on the server what he and I had done and what he had seen me do on my YouTube channel. In other words, inviting people into conversation, sharing their lives about an hour or so of pulling, of helping them tell their story. Mm -hmm. And then we did another very undiscord thing, which is that we created a culture where you gain status by using your real name on the server, not a little avatar and a little internet name. Yeah. And so the server has continued to grow and continued to evolve. I started doing, you know, a lot of people do question and answer type things on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I wanted a forum which was more interactive. So I started doing that mm -hmm. on the discord server. Mm -hmm. And that way they ask me a question, I can answer it, but I can also have them say, no, that wasn't really what I was asking, or yeah. this is what I was thinking. So we could actually have a conversation. Right. So, and then we've done watch parties where there'll be a video and you'll start a watch party and other people will come and then you can text chat while we're listening to it. Lately, I have, I am a, I have no love of, let me say it this way. So many of the administrative chores that are simply common to running a church, I find very meaningless. And so I avoid <laughs> right, them right. and procrastinate yes. with them. And most jobs have this kind of thing. And so yeah. lately, part of what I've been doing on the server is I will go into a chat room and I will turn on my camera. And it's another thing that we've been learning that text chatting is one thing, voice chatting is another, but if we can turn on our cameras and see each other, um, that adds yeah. another dimensionality. So- yeah. And for me, 
so obviously what what happens when you start a youtube channel and you go from 15 subscribers to a couple thousand subscribers to 15,000 subscribers you you blow away your dunbar number and you have to but if you're a pastor you really have to treat people like individuals and you really don't want to blow people off and you really want to embody the fact that their individual stories matter right 15,000 people and that posture do not get along very well right so what the what the what the discord server has sort of become is at least for the kinds of people who can handle the discord technology has become oh. an estuary of sorts because enough of the culture that I have established on my channel has gotten into the culture of the group that there is a level of expectation about treatment of individuals that has been perpetuated in that server. That server is not everyone's cup of tea. There's a Dunbar number effect to that server too. There are limitations to the technology, but I now have a high degree of confidence that if someone watches my channel and they want to engage in conversation, if they go to the Discord, there's at least a chance they might find a level of community that they will find helpful for addressing common loneliness, having a space where they can have a conversation with another person one-on-one -on -one or in a small group setting. So in some ways, the Discord server has sort of become a church, which is mm. really strange because that's how yeah. churches function. Right. Oh, interesting. And it's a work, it's very much a work in process. So there's, there's something about, so, so essentially you starting the Discord server like I didn't even start it. it. The guys started it. And that's an important distinction. Right. Okay. Got it. Yes. Because if I had to guys, run it, it would be a mess. Yeah. Yeah. That that pretty much goes for almost everything that's sustained in my life. If I had to run it, it would be a crumpled up piece of paper in the backseat of my car or something. Yeah. Right. Totally. So I, I definitely appreciate that. So So there's a way in which, there's a way in which for you, well, a couple of things. One of the things I heard is I heard like, to what degree you actually are a pastor, right? Because what I, I explicitly heard you say, that relationship between 15,000 people and you and the obligation of a pastor is to see each person as an individual. Like the math on that, right, is intense. So in some ways, this has helped distribute that right? The, 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 in a way that's church-like, which is probably something, I don't know if you, if you expected anything of it. I don't know if you expected that or. I, w I hoped for it because that similar dynamic happens in church. Because even in a yeah. small church like this, there's one pastor and there's way more need, even in a small congregation than one pastor can immediately address. And so churches by their divine design are always distributed agencies. So yeah. you have small groups, you have family units, you have elder yeah. districts. And so yeah. churches are always about having community scale down. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Huh. Interesting. And what's it been like? Has that affected? Well, I actually have a couple of questions that came up for me is like, one being a pastor you're you're that that role of being a pastor is so intriguing to me mm -hmm. um i uh i taught i actually did a for six months i taught a group of pastors right circling essentially um and and it and i really was kind of struck by that role of being this this in between right between the, the community and god in this in some sense a mediator and a translator and a, um it just it the profundity of it's really st struck me and so i just really heard it when you said like oh yeah as a pastor 
even looking at the people that are subscribed to my channels, I'm still obligated as a pastor. How, is there any, is there any point in your life when you're not a pastor? Like, is there any place in your life where you're not a pastor? If I talk to my wife in a certain way, she'll look at me and, you know, don't pastor me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, that's, you know, that it is a, it is an office that you fulfill and it's a role that you play. And it's a, it's not uncommon, especially in a small church, someone comes, someone comes into the church, they become a Christian, they, they're, they're in the middle of a big life transformation, and, and you've sort of been the midwife of that transformation, and they, well, now you and I are going to be best friends, and it's like, I really hate to disappoint you because you've sort of, you know, it's like when people fall in love with their therapists, the oh, therapist yeah. was, you know, was serving yeah. something. And so you have to kind of ease people through those things. And, yeah. and, and it's, and this is actually quite difficult for pastors because pastoring can be very lonely because yeah. of some of these things. It's difficult. You, you live in, you can live in very intense relationships with people in your church mm -hmm. and sometimes they are your friends and sometimes they're not, but the pastoring and the friendship can kind of get in the middle. And so sometimes you need friendships outside the church. Yeah. So it's a, because it's a traditional institution and not a modern one, like a therapist is a very modern institution. Here's yeah. the, the walls of the room. This is what we do in these walls. Outside of these walls, totally different relationship, not a pastor. Right. So there's there's lots and lots and lots to this, um, especially in, and if you get into differentiation of, let's say, a pastor and a priest, because pastors do do that priestly role, uh -huh. but they also do other roles that priests may or may not do. So yeah. there's, there's a lot, there's a lot going on there, but again, right. in a, a pastor who has a YouTube channel, that's new territory. Yeah. They missed that one when they wrote the Bible <laughs> or went to seminary. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would imagine there's just so much of that for you in these brand new questions that on some level really have not been asked or experienced that you're probably asking yourself, I would imagine, right? As a pastor, like being a public face, but being a public face in this, in this medium, right? And, you know, what are my obligations to that? Am I still a pastor in this being a public face? Am I somebody, am I just me? What's the difference between those two? I mean, these are really, really, really interesting questions. And it's different from being a, let's say a mega church pastor. Yeah. So if you're, if you're pastoring a congregation of a thousand or 5,000 or 10,000, and there are congregations out there like that, mm -hmm. that's different too. And like, it's like, you know, it's, I have the, I have the, I have the, the Calendly thing to get, you know, to the randos conversations and such. And people are always complaining. They can't get a slot. The truth is they can walk in the door on a Sunday morning and have pretty good access to me just by being here, but yeah. it's on the internet that, you know, I'm hard to get a hold of. Right. And so there's all these weird that dimensionalities. Is, that's really interesting. So it's, it's a, it is a bizarre thing. And I remember when, you know, that first, one of those early videos took off and I went from 15 YouTube subscribers for random local church people and family who, you know, were going to kind of support Freddie by watching the Freddie and Paul show to 2000, say 2000, it was like, okay, I'd stop, you know, let's, let's no more new subscribers. Let's just stop here. And yes, yes. Th that didn't happen. And so right. then it's okay. And, and, and so now for me too, with, 
I mean, is my church going to survive COVID? I don't know. Um, mm. Am I going to be a YouTube pastor? I don't know. I, I don't know where this thing goes. And so right. it's, you know, the Discord server, that was a whole new thing. So it's all exploration. And, but again, it's all mediated by the office and role of pastor and the right. traditions within that. Right. Right. Huh. So, and it's weird. It's weird. But I mean, you're yeah. doing lots of new things too. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you're, I mean you, you invented this circling and I mean, right. right. So, well, it's just, it's, it just, it's so interesting. It just is, it, it sounds impresses me, Paul, in that sense of just, you know, I've always thought this in relationship with you, but like when I talk with you, I'm just, you know, there's something about live, con you know, live conversations where I'm like, really, it, I find myself putting myself in your shoes. And it's so interesting because of this, there's a tradition that goes very deep, right? Like, and then a facing and an openness to the new, which I know with that tradition, its relationship to the new has been, you know, it's, <laughs> that has not been un uncomplex, yeah. you know, throughout. Um, and so there's a, it, it's just, it strikes me as a tension that you hold really well. But when you said it, when you said it like this, when you said, and I don't know where it goes, right? I think that you've been, it seems to me, at least from watching you, tell me if this is true, but from watching you, it seems to me that you're aware in a very, in a conscious way that there's an it that's going somewhere, yeah. right? That you, that you don't know where it goes, but there's a way where you've piped yourself right up to the face of, of that change, right? And you've really opened to it, right? And you've been talking to all kinds of people, right? Um, while being a pastor, right? Which is just so, it's so impressive. Yeah, it's so impressive to me. Well, I'm, you know, I'm also a third generation pastor. So mm -hmm. my grandfather, oh boy, um, you're right. These things go deep. Yeah. My, I was doing some some genealogy things with a guy on the Discord server who who used to be a Hasidic Jew, and you know a number of years ago we discovered that on my father's side of the family, there were Jews, and so we're trying to figure out at what point they sort of left the Jewish community, and you know, and how this how this intersected with immigration to the United States in the 1890s. And so then it was my great grandfather who came in over as a 19 year old to establish himself to bring my great great grandfather and some of the other family in. And I think at that point, they had probably been exiled from their Jewish community in the Netherlands. And then my grandfather, and so then they go to Western Michigan and they become part of Spring Lake Christian Reformed Church. And then my grandfather becomes a pastor. So, so there, was a, there was a leaving of the Jewish community and the Jewish religion. And then at some point, an embrace of this Dutch Calvinism in Western Michigan to the degree that my grandfather um, decided to become a minister. And my grandfather was known to be a rather dull preacher. In fact, he was such a dull preacher that at one point, back in those days, churches would call, would basically extend calls. It's how to recruit someone. Pastor sight on scene, and my 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 grandfather came and preached in their church, and the church decided they didn't want him because his sermon was so dull. But he was um, he basically stonewalled them, and they didn't because of the strangeness of Christian Reformed 
uh, rules and regulations. They couldn't really fire him after he had accepted the call, but they grew to love him because he cared for people so well and loved people well. And so then, you know, he wasn't as much of a preacher as he was a pastor. And, and then my father, um, my father's story was different in that he goes to Patterson, New Jersey, very different context. My grandfather had been in depression era um, churches throughout the Midwest and then into Canada. And then my father goes to Patterson, New Jersey and works with black folks. And I don't think my father had had any personal experience with the African-American community until he goes to Patterson. But my father was quite a bit of a better preacher because my grandmother would have been a great preacher, but women weren't oh. preachers back in the day. Oh, yes, yes. But my, right. my, grand, my father was a, was a very good preacher, but also had that pastoral heart of his father and yeah. you know, ministered to people at every level in Patterson. And so I, all of these things were built into me before I could have any conception of them. And then I didn't want to be a local church pastor. I got kind of backed into it after I, I would have rather done teaching or, or those kinds of things. But as it turned out, you know, I wound up here in this church and found I loved it. And all of what had been built in by my ancestry, yeah. by watching my father and my grandfather came into me. But now, so my grandfather, so my great grandfather was an immigrant from the Netherlands who somehow joined the Dutch Reformed Church. My grandfather becomes a minister in that and pastors to mostly dairy farmers in the Midwest and Canada and then some on the East Coast. My father then pastors to African-Americans and I become a foreign missionary and then pastor to a very multicultural community in Sacramento and then onto YouTube and Discord. And, you know, it's when you look at it generationally, it's like, it's rather breathtaking. Yeah. But the traditions and the values continue through the 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 technologies and the different communities right interesting so three you have a couple of generations back that you are so you're really built like it's tradition it's your personal tradition as well right that goes directly in your bloodline through this when you tell me about when you when you became a pastor you said you weren't expecting to do that. I didn't want to do that. You didn't want to do it. No. What because... was it before? What was it before you? What What was pastoring when you weren't wanting it? What weren't What weren't you wanting when? It was, it was all were... the It was all the differentiation stuff. I think from mm -hmm. <laughs> from the genetic and and parenting legacy I had. I wanted to differentiate myself from, from Stan, my father, you know, I, in Patterson, in the black community, right. the pastor is a big deal, even if the church is a small deal. <laughs> and I was little Rev and I look like him and I sound like him and I walk like him and I was the only son in the family. And, and so there was all of, and my father never put any of this on me. My parents never put any of this on me. Right. But I wanted to differentiate. And so I, I had a terrible time in college deciding what I wanted to do. I was in engineering. I was in math. I was in history. And, but I just really liked theology. And so, and I liked philosophy. And so I, I decided then to go to seminary and my, I didn't want to, I didn't want to become a local church pastor. So I thought, well, maybe I can teach theology. Maybe I'll get into the academia. And then um, my, I met my wife and she very much wanted to do foreign missions. And so we, well, there, that was easy because 
foreign missionaries, mo- they most they don't do any pastoring. They just teach. And then they get to have different cultures. And I liked cultures. So foreign missionary work was sort of a way out. Yeah. But that, um, you know, we we had to come back to the United States, you know, for a variety of reasons. Mm-hmm. And um, and then suddenly, what was I going to do for a living? Mm. And I was fixing computers for a while and teaching teaching therapists how to work PCs because they had to start putting things in PCs and therapists right. didn't know anything about computers. Right. And, and then, you know, I just, I, I needed to, I needed to earn more money for my family in the Christian Reformed church, being a local church pastor, you can live on that. And so right. I had the degree, I had the credential. Mm-hmm. And so I had the skill set. Yeah. So, and then I had a church in Chicago wanted me in this church in Sacramento and the church in Sacramento just looked like they needed me more than the church in Chicago. And it was much yeah. closer to what I had grown up in, in terms of a multicultural community, uh, yeah. a significant African-American population. And so it fit. Yeah. And so I came here and I started this and very quickly I discovered- How long ago I was that? It. That's 20, How long ago was that? 23 years ago. 23 years ago. I very quickly discovered, I enjoyed it. I really liked it. And Mm -hmm. the first day I walked to work, there was a woman sitting in the parking lot with a suitcase and, oh, okay. I, when they, when I took this call, they didn't tell me about all the homeless folks in the group homes and any of that, but all of that I had grown up with in Patterson with my father. And so that wasn't, I'd always lived with that population. That wasn't any problem at all. I yeah. deal with homeless yeah. people and mental illness and um, poverty and everything that goes along with it. I, that's what I'd grown up in, in terms of watching my father, watch, watching my father minister to those people. And the, the key thing, though, is seeing my father, I mean, we could... And, and you get you get this with doctors and therapists and you know mental health workers you get a certain gallows humor of the of the despair right. of so many situations right and right. but my never my father was never in any way demeaning oh. or he, he 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 i would i never saw him lose patience with the most unbelievably frustrating people <laughs> doing this, the most foolish, repetitive, yeah. self-destructive things. He right. always treated them with respect. He always treated them with kindness. He always treated them with love to the degree that I would sometimes pull my hair out and say, how can you, how can you walk into this idiocy one more time? And yet he would. Right. And I learned from that. I I learned both sides of that because my mother had considerably less patience with that and some wisdom about that. She would draw a line with people and say, here's the line. (laughs) And sometimes people need that line, but the, and, and so that's, and, and, you know, I saw a lot of that with Jordan Peterson too. You could tell he had paid his dues as a clinical psychologist and a therapist. Right. Right. Because I could see him one-on-one treating total strangers with kindness and patience. And when I saw that, that impressed me. And I thought, I'm, you know, I'm willing to give this guy a listen Uh, because uh, that's significant. That, and and specifically that, that ability to be have an unconditional regard for the humanity of another person. That's right. right. Independent of their of their circumstance or their or the form that they took. Yeah. That that regard to someone's is it is it an implicit dignity? Yeah. Hey, what with your dad? Like what what is the like wh- how did he is like how the hell did he do that? Right. How, how I'm going to post, I'm going to post the, I'm going to post the eulogy I gave at 
my father had a couple of memorial services. I'm going to post the eulogy that I gave at the memorial service in Patterson sometime on my channel. And I talk quite a bit more about him, but he, part of it was just him, how he was wired. Yeah. But part of it was, so, so in my grandparents' house, my, my grandfather took a call to a church in Owen Sound, Ontario. And this was in the fifties after the second world war and Dutch and Frisian immigrants were coming to Canada after the war. And today we would say, you know, they're all suffering from post-traumatic, you know, they had lived through the, the really brutal occupation of the Nazis in the Netherlands. And they would, they would come to Canada, they would have to have sponsors, but the, the dairy farmers that would sponsor them, that was sort of a way of farmers getting cheap labor that they could even potentially abuse. So it wasn't even easy for some of these people who came over from the Netherlands to work on dairies in Canada. And if any Dutchman would show up at the train station in Owen Sound, the, um, the person working at the train station would call my grandfather. And in the middle of the night, the phone would ring and okay. And my aunt told these stories because my father was already heading to college, but it, it talks about the, the character of my grandfather. Okay, um, Glenda, that's my aunt. You're going to have to go, you know, you're going to have to go, you know, spend the rest of the, your night with your brother. We're going to give these people the room or, you know, whatever you need to do, because we're going to take these people into our house and we're going to feed them. And throughout the depression, also stories of the, the hobos would mark the, would mark the phone poles with chalk until you get in front of the preacher's house. They'd put a special mark there because they'd know you knock at that door and these people will give you food. And during the depression, my grandmother, she was a writer too. She, she wrote an article for the banner, like, um, you know, two cents and 13 pounds of butter because the farmers didn't have any cash. So they're all dairymen. So they would pay the preacher in butter, but how much butter can you eat? But yet my grandparents, despite <laughs> right. their poverty, they never had right. much money. You know, right. someone comes and knocks at their door, they will feed them. Ooh. And, and so that was, that's Ooh. what my father grew up. This is what a Christian is. So then he goes to Patterson and a totally different context, but this is what a Christian is. These people who show up at your door, they are image bearers of God and you'd better treat them that way. It doesn't yeah. matter if they're mentally ill, if they're homeless, if they're, um, <laughs> I tell this story in the eulogy. There was once a guy who parents, I, I get the story wrong and my mother often corrects it, but I'll tell it the way I remember it. You know, the guy comes at, we, the guy comes, he needs something. And so dad brings him home and he eats dinner with us. And my father liked photography and had this old camera, probably wasn't worth that much. So this guy ate with us. The guy eventually turns around. Our house was always getting broken into because it was a bad neighborhood in Patterson. And so the guy breaks into our house, steals the camera that he had spied when the preacher who had taken him to give him a meal, gave him a meal. That's, that's pretty despicable. So the guy gets arrested. My father visits him in jail and it'd be like, I'd be, I'd want to give the guy the finger. I'm not going to, you know, right. guy visits yeah. him. My father visits him in jail and the guy says, feeling a little guilty. Oh, by the way, you know, I pawned your camera. And so what did my father do? He goes to the pawn shop and buys it back. You know, and it's like, and, and my father, you know, he would forgive this guy who, who, who betrayed his trust. You know, this is, this is the stuff that, you know, this is Jean Valjean type stuff. And, and my father lived that way. And I, you know, as a kid, you don't, you don't know what you're watching. This is just imprinting on you. Yeah. And yeah. so when I, so I find myself in this church, how do you treat people? This is how you treat people. This is, yeah. 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 And then now yes. people write me letters and emails and it's like, I don't always get to see them and I don't answer them back. And, you know, I, I try, but I get weary, but you know, 
this is try try to pay attention try to treat treat them as an individual try to love them mm -hmm. right right and 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 it's also it just seems like what you're talking about like loving them treating them as an individual i mean these things are inexhaustible right there's a i, I don't know if there's I don't know if there's any end to which to the degree that I could see you, right? I don't know if there's any end to the degree. These things are inexhaustible, like, and mysterious all the way down, right? I think that's the thing that I, as you're talking about it, I'm, I'm it, like, what it's I'm noticing, the one who's listening as you're talking, <laughs> right, is keeps getting the sense of that. I think on one, on one level, there's, what it takes right to be able to the guy who stole from you to visit him in jail and then go buy back your your property your property it, like what it what it where where is it that that one is like, what is he looking at? What is he listening to? Who is that? Like that capacity to see someone and to, and to even when they're completely devastated of any of their own sense of dignity, that the, the very fact of their existence is that which is deserved of my respect. That sense of being able to be respectful at that deep of a level what is that that's showing to like what's glowing forth to him such that that's a saying that's the only it's the it's the most matter of fact response what is it that's showing glowing yeah. forth to him and now to you that to, when you experience that what is it that you're seeing when you look at somebody i, I don't know that you see it so much but it's that's that's in some ways how you're programmed. And there's lots of other programming that's saying, you know, don't do this. I mean, and I just had, so, you know, I made a video a little while ago when I put, you know, one of the homeless guys in jail and he just got out of jail. And um, in, in a sense, the system is working because he hasn't shown up at church. He came and got his shopping cart and I haven't seen him. I know I will see him. He will come back. I know it will happen. And he's probably really pissed at me because, you know, he thought the cops were inside. He was probably only going to go to jail for a few hours and he was there for a week. But, you know, he's and I don't I think it's. I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. Obviously it's, you know, theologically the answer is easy, but to, but to live it out. Yeah. And, and, and it's also not, I mean, Jordan Peterson in 12 rules for life has a chapter, which I, I thought it was, it was the chapter that hit me most where he basically deconstructed um, he, he deconstructed a, a, a benevolence that we have. And this, it was very neat. It was very Nietzschean in that there's a, there's a, there's a false performative potential to all of this too. Yeah. I was just going to say. And, and that, so it, 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 it's this, this, like you say, you know, there's no bottom to this thing. <laughs> right, right, right. Especially if it's in you, you know, there's no bottom to this thing. Cause am I, am I trying to, you know, am I trying to impress this other person by my generosity? Am I trying to impress God by my generosity? Am I, I mean, and I, what I loved about that chapter in that book, which I, which I don't, I've never heard anybody else talk about that particular chapter, but it's, it's something that someone in a helping, it's something, someone in a helping profession would know mm. because 
you might be you might be looking like you're a saint you might be thinking that you are a saint you might be impressing the hell out of yourself and other people about your saintliness but there's a certain degree of um self-serving that is going on in your little game and that that needs to be that needs to be seen in yourself too yeah yeah Yeah. So there's a quote. So there's a, there's a, cause I was just going to say when he said, well, on some level it's been programmed into me. And I, <laughs> I was like, well, at least the picture I'm having of, especially as you talk about with your dad, I'm like, doesn't seem like he's following a rule. Seems mm -hmm. like he's in a relationship with something that has it's in, it seems inexhaustible and seems to evoke a concurrent inexhaustibility in response, right? And it's funny because I think a, a part of the, one of the reasons why this is, is kind of hitting me so deeply as you're talking about it is I read that, uh, oh, the, it's, it's a book, Jonathan, who I'm talking with for the first time later this week, is um, talking with Jonathan Peugeot. Oh, um, really? <laughs> Jonathan's on a tour. This is, I'm yeah, loving yeah, these conversations yeah. he's having. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. But the, the, uh, he reckoned, he had somebody on it, I think a month or two ago, um, who wrote a book on the, the Christian, like basically the, the rise of Christendom, right? And specifically, it's a book, is it called Reform? It's, it's just of a, it, it has a picture of the, of, of Jesus on the cross, but you're looking down. It's got a picture. Oh, of Dominion. Like, as a, yeah, Dominion, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So I'm in the middle of that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and I, I mean, it's it's it's. I don't know. There's something. There's something about the way he wrote that really highlights. Um. To what degree? <laughs> to what degree this sense of looking at being and valuing it, right? As thou, right? This sense of thou and just in its own factness, that, like that inexhaustibility at one point wasn't there, right? And, and then Jesus comes on, right? On the scene. <laughs> and I'm just trying, it's just, it's so striking to me that like, I don't even know if Jesus could understand what Jesus was saying, <laughs> right? It was so like, by what horizon of intelligibility could it, could he understand or anybody understand it, right? In some degrees, that's how it was able to get off the ground is because the Romans couldn't even be, probably couldn't even perceive it, let alone be threatened by it, right? So kind of, I, kind of, I think there's something about getting the proof brutality of the world right prior to christendom right that is i mean i knew this before but i perhaps it's this is one of those things where there's no there's no uh, there's no there's no end of depth upon which you can know um how deeply the impact of in the revolution Christendom was right, and before that, it's in in that, and it's so part of us that when we look back at our history and we 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 look at the Greeks and the Romans, you know, prior to Christ, we think that we think that we're looking at them, but we're, we're we cannot not look at them without the frame, which is pretty much our frame, called Christianity. And so I'm, pre I'm just, I've been reading that. I'm just really present to that experience of, oh yeah, like this is, people are so Christian. They don't even, they don't even know they, it. They don't even know it. Right. Just the, 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 the and then what I'm talking about is the, is the basic pre-reflective sense of when you point at something, just that self-evident somethingness that it is that you 
don't even have to think about is it's at that level of that's where Christianity is, which I think is also giving me a deeper sense of what it means or what it possibly means when the explicit sense of Christianity, right, is changing so dramatically, right? And church attendance is down and all these kind of like, you start thinking about that stuff and it just, it, it's, I, I think we're in a time that's just really striking in other words, right? where we can actually see it in our lifetime. We can see these things that used to take thousands of years, right, to change. We're seeing a bunch of them happening in our lifetime. We can see it and we can have a conversation about it, right? This is, I think we're in a time that's really, really stunning in that, in that respect. And I think a lot of it has to do with this you know, everything that we've just been talking about. Yeah. Holland's book is, no, I, I, I really, I really, I think you're dead on right. I think you're dead on right. And the fact that we're watching this play out so quickly and so dramatically, mm-hmm. you know, another, another thing I think of, Christians would like to take Holland's book and say, oh, see, it's Jesus. I, part of what's interesting to me about Holland's book, and in fact, the story of Christianity, is that even following Jesus, even in Jesus' name, the church didn't avoid being tyrannical. Mm-hmm. And that, that is, in a sense, what the Protestant Ref- Reformation was about. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Jonathan Peugeot he had a conversation that was just posted with Adam friended and, and part of what Jonathan what the point that Jonathan was making there is that in modernity, um, the state sort of uh, has become tyrannical in some ways. Well, in the church had also, the church has also had its tyrannical moments and you know, part of what I, I took from that book too is I've been reading some more Enlightenment stuff lately. You know, the Enlightenment for all of the the dirt Christians sometimes kick up at it. It was the Enlightenment that was really important in helping the church uh, divorce itself from some of its tyrannical ways and um, helping the church develop to at least to the degree that it can this universal regard for the outcast and uh, it, and even people whose suffering is well earned <laughs> because that's you know, a lot of the people I deal with their suffering is well earned and I was just this morning there was a a woman sitting on the 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 brickwork over here by church and she was having a fight with her husband right out here in the street, which growing up in Patterson was not an unusual circumstance. Whenever whenever there was a fight, everybody came out to watch the fight. (laughs) Nobody came out to watch this fight because this fight was just, you know, she was accusing him of infidelity and he was accusing her of, you know, they, they were just screaming at each other at the top of their lungs, just 20 feet from my door. And so it was like, okay, and, uh, should I, should I go out there and sit down with you two and maybe see a nod conversation? So I'll leave you two to your misery. But no, the 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 idea which Tom Holland I think demonstrates is that Jesus reprogrammed human culture at such a deep level, and and it took hundreds and hundreds of years. And in fact, many centuries for that deep programming to play out. And it's still, and as you said right now, it's still playing out very quickly and very rapidly in our midst. And it it's not it unlike a computer rollout that let's say I just saw Zoom updated their software and we all get, you know, 5.4.3 or something like that. 
the 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 reprogramming of us happens in conflict and and there are different sure. both the you know in terms of our current culture war which really annoys people on both sides often when i say it both sides are in some ways manifesting jesus even in their fight both the yeah. the woke who you know want this ultimate regard and ultimate war against racism and sexism and all of that and the hidebound traditionalist culture warriors who want to maintain traditional marriage etc cetera, etc cetera. both sides are manifesting jesus mm -hmm. and neither side can neither side is willing to see jesus in the other right and that isn't to say that neither side is something incredibly valuable and important that they're fighting for but that what we're continuing to work through is this deep reprogramming that jesus did and the only way we you know unlike a computer where you just click a button and you know new code replaces the old code our distributed cognition system is far deeper and broader and more complex. So, and, and, and that then means that the church and all the churches are part of that reprogramming because it's the church that actually preserves a lot of the, a lot of the inherited code and keeps that inherited code alive because that's right. what we keep bouncing against in some ways, the way that my mother's code and my father's code got built into me because yeah. my grandparents were two different individuals that got built into my father. Yeah. So my yeah. father inherited the, you know, the, the absolute regard for the other from his father, but got some of the preaching and, stuff from his mother and mm -hmm. you know i got some yeah. of the compassion from my father but got some of the the trollish yes. boundary markings from my mother who if yeah. my mother hadn't you know managed the checkbook and drew lines for my father the house we lived in would have been not fit for children to grow up in my mother kept those boundaries this right. is our home he, you can you can basically the rule was with my father that he never had any money with him because my mother wouldn't give him any and but if he went out and had preaching or said a little bit of extra money that he could keep for himself and what did he do with that she, the reason she didn't give him money because he'd always give his money away because people would ask him for money and he'd always give it <laughs> Right, right, right. And so my mother's like, I'm not giving you too much money because you know what? The children need to eat. <laughs> right, right. Totally. Totally. Yes. Yes. Right. So as a so as a unit, they could they could figure that out. But as a culture now, we've got this code from Jesus. And well, what does the Jesus code mean with respect to the same sex attracted person or the person who feels like they're they're their biological gen, their biological sex and their emotional sex are are a mismatch. Or, yeah. you know, how how do we how do how does what does Jesus have to do with that? And that's what we're working right. out right now. Yeah, yeah, right, right, <laughs> right. So, in some sense. You know, I think it's just that in some in some sense, well, actually, you 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 said something earlier in the conversation where you you said this thing about prayer, right? Which like, is it is it that I'm changed through prayer, or is it that God's changed through prayer, right? These these questions of of like. And this sense of prayer, and there's one of the things that's there for me is one of the things I notice is I don't have much of, I don't have a lot of anxiety around the existence of God question um, for me. And I think some of that is just has to do with just a, an actual lack of, I don't come from any place. I don't have any kind of over religious 
um, practices in my background, right? So in some senses, I'm just, I don't have a lot of those anxieties that I'm pressing against or, or averting or something like that. There's just like, a, and I'm just kind of temperamentally really open, right? So, but I do, I definitely notice the extreme, like the, the anxiety that people have around this explicit conversation called the existence of God. And I notice I don't have it. I don't have much of it. I'm like, well, let's see if it's a, if it's, I think there's places where it's really interesting, right? Is this, this kind of conversation about like the theism or not theism, right? Like the, the sense of there being a personal address. And I, I, one of the things for me where God has always, I guess it's like, I think where I find myself most, mostly dwelling is in, in the way in which the sense of the divine or the sacred has this quality of withheldness or concealment, right? And I, and it's in that, that I notice it's my relationship to this sense of the, of, of the sacred has this quality of, of where it, it withdraw, it reveals itself in its withdrawal in a certain sense. And in the trick, the tricky part of this, or the, I think the personally, the, the, the personal challenging part of that, right, is not, is not to, well, as if you could, is not to, is not to make it unconcealed, but it's behold or be in a, a relationship with it in such a way that it it can it can be it can reveal without having without it having to be unconcealed right so for example it's like there's a way in which the unknown another way of putting that is the unknown um can become present without making it known and in some senses right the unknown we can become present with that and making it known is not revealing at all, right? So there's that quality of concealment, which is for me, and actually this comes together. I just thought, I found this poem I wrote. If I, I can share it with you. Yes, please do. Just a number of years ago. Um, what is this? called the, the most asking question. You planned it this way, didn't you, God? You knew to put yourself just out of our grasp. It's the space between us where we must widen. Oh, so completely unfold feel the untouchable spot, ask the unanswerable question, and deny ourselves the never satisfied desire that constantly wiggles in our belly. Is this the place, God, the gap between you and I that is the window where you stand and peer out upon your making. Is that you feeling yourself in my strain? Is that you, God, sitting just behind my eyes as I look for you walking in circles? When the, when the leaf dances delicately in the wind, and for a moment, we trade places and beauty breathes me. Is that you who is satisfied? And is it me wanting more? 
That's really beautiful. That's really good. Thank you. <laughs> you should you should uh, send that to me. That's that's, so well. that's really good. Thank you. The the story in Genesis in Genesis three, mm -hmm. where so the man and the woman are in the garden, and the the setting is that in some ways the garden is the royal garden. The, the temple has been built in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. It's been populated in Genesis 3. Um, of course, the, the man and the woman have had the episode by the tree. And um, the man and the woman hide. And, I mean, who told you you were naked? And then there's the you know, the, the fig leaves and then Peugeot always, you know, the garments of skin um, and then the exile from the garden. The, I mean, the, the foundation, the foundation of my theological tradition is that God cannot be wielded. What does that mean? That means that, you know, he cannot be grasped. Yeah. Because when we grasp something, we 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 know its boundaries, and so your your poem is really I found that deeply moving. Because in the conceit, you know what God, it, it, to a certain degree, a big part of the exile from the garden is. Don't call me, I'll call you. And, um, and it really isn't even don't call me because they do call. And this, this one of the strange things about the story of the altars don't appear in the Bible until Genesis 4 with Cain and Abel, and they're making sacrifices. There are no sacrifices in the garden. The, the, the only implicit ones were the animals that had to offer their skin to cover the man and the woman. And, and so this strange, what, what you wrote about is a, is a very big deal theologically and in the Bible, because the promise, the promise of scripture, the fulfillment is imagined that we will see each other face to face, us and God that we will see the face of God. And, and in scripture, we're told you can't see the face of God or you will die. And so something in us has to change so that we're able to see it. C.S. Lewis, I think his best novel, it wasn't the Narnia novels, those were children's stories, but uh, a book he wrote, Till We Have Faces. And it's a retelling of a... Um, it's a retelling of a myth, which is Lewis loved mythology. So it's a retelling of the myth. And just right there, even in the title, Till We Have Faces, the um, basically underneath the novel, the novel Lewis is making the point, it's not that God doesn't have a face that we can see. It's that we don't have faces through which to see his. Hmm. It's not that God doesn't have a face for which we could see. It's that we don't have faces for which to see his. Right. That's the point of the novel. Mm. Mm. And how, how on earth do you get an idea like that across? Well, you write a novel. But I, I, really, I really loved your poem. Uh, that, that was really profound and meaningful. Because it's the... So just before you, and, and I'll post it on the channel, I was, I was talking to a guy who has, you know, been fighting cancer for years now, and he's, 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 he's grown spiritually since my first talk with him. My first talk with him was, he was much more in that Petersonian space where, um, you know, he's sort of interested in religion, but, you know, the whole God thing, and 
he was more in that space. And when I talked to him today, we were talking about the corruption of institutions and the disappointment of experts in our lives. And I asked him, I said, because he's having to deal with medical establishment all the time because of his fight against cancer. And I said, well, how, how are you living then in that space where on one hand, you both with reason distrust doctors and medical institutions but you have to engage them in order to continue to live. And he just said, God. And, and he talked about how sort of in the moment of, of pain and distress, you know, God is present, but then often afterwards, after the battle in the exhaustion, that's when God, in a sense, hides his face or he can't see God. And um, of course, what's that? I mean, when he's exhausted, yes, is yes. When he has a hard time seeing God. Yeah, and and of course, at the center of Christianity is Jesus' recitation of Psalm twenty-two on the cross: "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" At the at in in some ways the you know, one of the one of the pinnacle moments of the drama of Christianity. Christ yells that from the cross. And, and, you know, the, so I'm a Christian minister and, you know, we've talked about that quite a bit. So we talked quite a bit about the pastoral relationship, but the preaching aspect of my vocation, part of my job is to point to God, to be a sign but throughout Christianity, the, the sign of God is, it's certainly there in the sacraments, but the sign of God is in the lives of, the cruciform lives of the Christians. It's in, it's in, the faithfulness when God himself isn't looking very faithful. Yeah. Which yeah. is exactly what the cross is. Yeah. Yeah. So when on the, so Jesus is, Jesus says that when he's on the cross. Right. Right. My God, my wow. God, why have you forsaken me? Right. What happens after that? Well, he he keeps hanging, he keeps suffering, yeah. and there's you know, then of course in Luke there's this this famous conversation with the one of the and these are these are these are revolutionaries who are being crucified for um, resisting the Roman occupation, and one of them is giving Jesus is mocking Jesus along with everyone else. You know, you're supposed to be a miracle worker. You would think, you would think you could use your, your ostensible privilege with God to avoid this, which is a big reason why many Muslims doubt that the crucifixion happened. And the other, the other person says, "Why are you mocking this guy? You and I were Roman. We were revolutionaries. We, you know, they're probably being crucified because they killed." <laughs> they killed Roman soldiers. And he said, this other guy, he didn't do anything. He didn't, everybody knows, everybody knows who Jesus is. He overturned Ooh. some money changers, temp, you know, but he didn't, he didn't kill anyone. In fact, and they probably didn't know this story, but in fact, in the garden, when he was arrested and his disciples took up the sword, he healed the work of their swords. And so Jesus hangs and suffers and after having said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His last words are, into your hands I commit my spirit. So right there you have that, the dynamic that you have in your poem. Yeah. That on one hand, Jesus in the most alarming, you know, he who, he who spoke of himself as the son of God, 
and talked about his union with God in a way that would get him killed in a Jewish community, on the same cross declares the abandonment of God. And yet, even in that time of abandonment, relinquishes himself fully into that abandoning God's arms. And, and this is the thing about these, the dynamics of the, of the elements of the Christian drama. It's all of these contrasts. Yeah. He who is God is abandoned by God. In the moment of abandonment by God, he relinquishes his soul into thy hands. I commit my spirit. And, and it, it, it's, it, uh -huh. and, and, and your poem reflects that you can't put these things together. <laughs> they don't, yes. they and don't. Yes. And, and that somehow in the strange way is their togetherness. Right. Right. Yes. Right. And it's, yes. it's in God's concealment that he is revealed. Yes. But that just doesn't yes. sound to like make any sense, but right. there it is. Yeah. And yeah. God abandons Jesus on the cross. And so he commits his spirit to him. Yeah. You know, and if a kid, you know, if some kid grew up and their parent was negligent and you're going to commit your spirit to the arms of that negligent parent, and, and this is part of the reason why all of these attempts of, you know, in the in in a in a portal conversation between Eric Weinstein and and Ross Douthat, Eric Weinstein basically says, "Well, if Jesus was today was around today, wouldn't we just meme him to death?" And it's like, well, you haven't read the Gospels, because that's exactly what they tried, and they didn't just try to destroy his reputation; they hung him naked on a cross which yeah. was which was destroying Jesus at every level you could destroy a human being by being yeah. hung naked on a cross you take away all of their dignity you destroy their reputation even in an old testament way because the verse in Deuteronomy where you know anyone who is hang, hung from a tree is despised certainly in a karmic way he must deserve it and so yeah. the the attempt is Go ahead and just try to destroy him in every way you can. And he keeps coming back. Go ahead and hate him and he will show his love to you. Go ahead and abandon him and he will give himself fully to you. Yes. You can't. Yeah. You, and this is, and this I think Tom Holland picks up on. This is the deep reprogramming of history that Jesus accomplishes. And, and of course, that's an audacious statement that if you had made in, let's say, the first century when the, um, or end of the first century when the book of Revelation, the apocalypse was written, seems totally out of keeping with what anyone would assert. But by 400 years later, few people could deny. And now 2,000 years later, there's a lot of, the, the only way to really deal with Jesus is to avoid him. That, that is really the only way. But that then is also the definition of hell. Hell is, hell is complete denial and refusal of God, finally to say to God, I want to, I want to avoid you utterly and completely. And God says, okay, that's hell. Right, right. That's, it's that spot right in the middle of that total, it's, it seems like on one level, hell strikes me as something like that spot is a double bind. Like heaven is something like that very same spot is a paradox, right? It's like, there's a deep, there's something about that that's so deep to what, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. It's just, there's, because I get every morning, in the morning I get up, I, and I've been having this practice for the last 
I've had about, about a month or so, pretty much. Every morning I get up and I meditate the sun up. And usually it cooperates. Um, <laughs> but, and, and then I, I, like deep in my meditation, I started praying. Right? And I hadn't really prayed in, in, a, in, a, in a while. And it was, it's been a striking experience, like to pray. Um, Cause it's, it's a strange kind of intimacy. It's, it's very intimate, but in a way that's very odd in a, in a sense. Cause there's a, there's, and what, you know, what's interesting is, is of course, you know, I'm meditating. So I'm like, kind of, you know, I have this, you know, hour into it or something, the sun's coming up and I'm like just present with what is. And so there's this kind of open sense of awareness, right? That just can notice things. So there's that part of it. So there's a part that's like wide open as I'm praying. So it's like, there's the, the experience of like saying the words. Um, and then there's also just a noticing of the experience of all of it, right? At the same time, that's really open. And what's striking about it is, um, well, it puts me right in that place of, well, I think it more realizes that place of what I spoke of in the poem is, I don't quite exactly know who's talking to who. <laughs> like, yet there is a quality of, well, one is, and I'm not expecting an answer. I'm not like, I'm, I'm I'm speaking, but I'm not expecting an answer. Yet there's a listening, a deep listening in myself that's somehow part of the speaking. But I don't, I'm not expecting an answer, yet I'm, and I don't know if I'm hearing something, but I'm definitely, there's a deep listening. And I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering, what am I listening? Like, what is, What's calling forth that listening? Um, and so in some ways, I think in some ways, and I've noticed that this has been the case, I think more, which also I think is just a function of age, right? Is, I'd say like the first, I don't know, 40, 40 years or so <laughs> was for me was the question or the pressure was what life was a kind of pressure to where what seemed to be really important is to make sure that I was someone, mm. right? That, that there was a kind of an existential, almost it felt existential, like a implicit pressure in being mm. is to be someone, right? Mm -hmm. And that there's something about that I've been given existence that I found myself in, right? <laughs> I, I don't remember asking for it, right? I don't remember even wanting it. Yep. But yep. I kind of came to with a first name and a last name, and I'm <laughs> with a boatload of concerns. So there's this kind of there's this quality of that, you know, what is it? What is it that can justify the fact of my existence? Right, like, what is it? What is it that, that can justify the most profound gift? And I think when I was younger, it felt implicitly like the way one did that is by becoming someone, right? Um, helping enough people, or or whatever the call was. And now it feels a lot more like a sense of. Well, you know, first of all, it seems like I can't actually repay my existence because everything, anything that I do presupposes the existence that I've been given. So there's a, there's a sense in which it's, it's, it's unpayable back to, right? There's one of those par paradoxes. And I think what's more there now is the sense in which is, uh, as Corey Anton would say, you already are more than you've ever accomplished or ever could accomplish. 
right? There's this sense and just the very facticity of yourself and what we are is already more, right? Than I could ever accomplish. And that there's a way in which, and it's funny, I don't know if I can quite put words to it, but there's a, there's a, there's a quality of where the ethos, the, the sense of an ethics almost, is one in which it seems to be more about, can I be, how good of a, that part of me, which is a host to all of it, can I be a good host, right? Mm. Can I be, um, can, can, can as few moments pass away um, not anonymous in my gaze, right? There's that sense, there's that quality in where it feels a little bit more like that, um, the solace or the, the refuge or the, the point is to, is to be a site for God's face, if you will, right? Of be, in some sense, I would imagine, is to, is to, and I think this is probably what's attracted me to Heidegger all these years, is this way that he's continually talking about the clearing, right? Or the, the way in which we are an opening for world. And there's a way in which the, we can witness it and we get to say what we think about it, right? Which is just stunning. That seems to be, that feels more like as I've gotten older, I've been noticing it's, I feel a lot less of that pressure <laughs> mm. to be someone. Um, mm -hmm. And there's more, there's more of a sense, and I wouldn't say it's a pressure, it's more like a, an understanding. It's like way in the background of, of, you know, actually it's like, can I be a really, how, how, how profound of a witness can I be, hmm. right? How deeply can I be with that it is, right? Not so much what it is, but that this is. Right, the, just the sense of like, can I, <laughs> can I, can I actually like allow myself to even come close to how strange it is that that there's anything at all, right? Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. like, if I'm lucky enough to be able to to be shaken by it enough to be able to say a couple of things about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good, and to. And to have, and to participate in that, you know, obviously in a in a Christian, in a Christian frame, the the reprogramming that Jesus does to get back to the middle voice here Ooh. happens as the you know you, you talked about witness witness is always as is this dual-sided word you know it's the it's it's us being a witness to and being a witness of and and it's it's this carrying forward into every generation this this programming that's in a sense how the world gets programmed um no oh, that's that's really that's really that's really fascinating and profound what you just laid out there it it takes a it 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 definitely takes a certain stillness yeah especially in our culture yeah which is so frenetic right so distracted oh yeah and 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 i think um, because it is so deeply anxious. And, you know, the, the word in the, at the time of the exile from the garden is, um, you know, in a sense, 
you can't, you can't, you can't get to me, but I will come to you. What that move in terms of the relationship means is that the man and the woman and their children are now going to be profoundly aware of the giftedness of being. Like, just like you said, this, this has been given to you. Yeah. Right. right. Period. There's no, you know, you didn't ask to come into being. You yeah. cannot secure your being. Yeah. It's, it's, it's gift. Right. And that. We're down. What's that? All the way down. All the way down. Right. And, and. And that the, the facing that leads us often to anxiety because we can't trust the giver. And and the kind of peace that we have, I'm not saying we can't trust the giver. We have trust issues. I'll say it that way. We have trust issues. At least. <laughs> and yeah. and so to be to be at peace with the gift is in some ways to make peace with the giver. Mm. And he hasn't been our enemy. Mm. Um, he's terror in some ways, he's absolute terror because we are dependent, but he's not our enemy. And I think that that is the I think that is, oh, my camera overheated. So I'm still here. Um, okay. I'll, I'll let it cool down. I'll turn it back on again in a second. Um, that is in many ways the what I see as the heart of the Christian message, which is that um, hmm. what, what, what God finally reveals through his son is that he is not our enemy and he can be trusted, which is in the midst of this brutally painful world, something we desperately need to hear. Yeah. Yeah. The, the last conversation I had, again, talking to someone who's been fighting cancer for the last how many years? He's a young man. Um, you know, he's been reading Russian <laughs> Russian horror stories, basically, of the 20th century, and there's plenty of them. And it, it's it's so interesting that it's in those, I mean, you and I live dramatically privileged lives. You know, we live in this outstandingly beautiful state, yeah. astoundingly affluent. You know, even in this time of COVID, you and I are are fortunate in our career choices. Mm -hmm. But and and so in one way, it's relatively easy to express trust in the giver of what we've received. But to those who um, who can very much identify with the cry of the crucified Jesus on the cross, that ability to trust the giver enough to commit his spirit into his hands, yeah. that's saying something. Right. It's like a it's a real sovereignty. Talk about sovereignty. Yeah. There is a quality of it. It reminds me a little bit about someone once said, I think it was my dad who told me this. Like, so like for if if there's a reason you're forgiving someone, it's not forgiveness. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? right. It's like there's it's like there's, and I think that says something about the 
like the place of what really forgiveness seems to be, which is, which is, it's a, what you're tending to is ontological. It's not conditional, right? Yep. So yep. it's like forgiving isn't, isn't like, okay, I've been able to understand enough such that I can weigh it out myself such that I forgive you, yep. right? It's yep. more like, this is why I think that like a good measure, it seems, is like, well, I've noticed, I've noticed it seems to be there's a huge correlation between where people are suffering, right? And their level of judgment. <laughs> Seem to go hand in hand, right? Like, and it's, and it's, uh, and it also where people seem to be most genuinely open and in a flow and is, is now I'm not talking about discernment. I'm talking about judgment, which seems to be this thing that I think must come involved in when we trust, because there is a quality of where there is something in which at the end of the day, I think that's something that no one can do for me. Like they can't, they can't give me the experience of me trusting them. <laughs> right. Yeah or the experience of me seeing them as trustable. There is this quality where it just, that seems to be a very, very deep relationship with myself, right? Yeah. Um, that, that is an act of, it's a, it's a generous act. Yeah. Like if you, if you think about it, it is a very generous act. To, yeah. to, I always feel that it is when people yeah. trust me, there's always a sense where it's like, I feel a sense of where I feel the generativity yes. of them. Yes. Like I don't, yes. it's not like I like, I look at myself and feel super proud of myself. Like, yes. because there is a recognition of where, yes. you know, it's actually, yeah. that's where it is. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. if you wanted me to lose. <laughs> yeah. And it's I, even in our I, language, I, we extend yeah. trust in the direction. Yes. We extend trust. Yes. And here's the thing about the other thing about trust though, too, is I don't know if it's if it, I don't know if I stop trusting somebody. I think it's like I start trusting something else. Ah, yes. It, yes. Right. Because I've noticed that about, around in conversations in my um, you know, it, well, wherever there's people, you know, you'll, you'll have these kind of conversations, but where, when somebody says like, I don't trust you, or I don't trust them. It's really interesting how it's, there's this strange stop where all the action stops and it's almost impenetrable. It's like, all right, you don't trust me or you don't trust them or you don't trust it or everything, all of your participation and the quality of that participation is banking on that. And that's something that if it's not there, it seems like, it seems like it's so difficult to penetrate that. And so what I started to do with people is I was like, okay, so like, let's just say that you couldn't not trust. Let's just say all you could do is you could say, I used to trust you and now i trust what some thought about mm. you or some sense of investing right mm. that's really good that's really good it and i think it's that scales that that scales not just in terms of interpersonal but also people's identity within called the agent arena relationship, their identity within whatever worldview they're inhabiting, that, that it is a, um, it is a, you, you start trusting something else. I think that's really, I think that's really true and, and, and quite right. Because otherwise the responsibility is still on the thing, mm -hmm. right? But and then maybe it's, it's it's also probably a really good thing. It's like Jesus, there is a, a lot worth like worth not trusting. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Like obviously, right? 
yeah, that, that, but that sense in which that is a real sovereign, where I trust and where I don't trust is really sovereign, right? When it comes down to it, I think, or can be. And, and I, you know, I've really, I've really, you know, I've, re I've really appreciated and, and benefited a lot from, from John's work. Um, you know, his awakening from the meaning crisis, he took 50 hours to lay all that stuff out. And right. his, his, his four P's of knowing is something that I've used a lot because it, you know, that, that participatory, um, that perspectival, I mean, that's really, and, and as, you know, as a Christian minister, that's what I've seen in people. It's, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say that, that none of the propositional is important. No, that's, that's, that's got its place and it's got its, but, but I, I think the, the participatory and the procedural, which both trust is at that level. And there's certainly other elements of the, um, of the propositional and the um, procedural, the, um, I, I, I almost always forget one of those darn P's, um, but the propositional, yeah. Propositional, procedural, um, perspectival, participatory. participatory. There they all are. Um, trust hits more of them. Trust, trust, trust almost hits them all at a deep way more than many of the other things that we're dealing with. Right. And, and so it, it is such a key, it is such a key to life. You know, again, you can go back to the Genesis three story and the, the fall happens. What well, the, the way, where the serpent attacks is their ability to trust their maker. That's exactly where the serpent puts his finger and says, this is where I'm going to push. And if I, if I dislocate that, everything else slides. And cool. I see in, so again, another aspect of pastor is being with people in their relational miseries. And, and so often it comes down to, you have to trust this other person. If you're going to, I, I think you said it very well. Um, that you can't, you know, a huge correlation with their level of suffering and their level of judgment. I can't trust that other person or there's their misery. Well, you have to trust that other person, but they're not trustworthy. That's true. <laughs> and so there are limits, there are boundaries, but if you're actually going to make progress in this relationship, you're going to have to extend trust one more time. Yeah. And you might get burned again. You know, we're, we're not, there's no guarantees here, but that's, that's the path. And, and so, and, and, and the forgiveness, yeah. you know, your father's saying you about forgiveness, that's exactly right. Yeah. It's not yeah. a reason. Forgiveness is not a reason. Right. Yeah. There's no reason for it. I mean, maybe <laughs> like, so your, <laughs> so your name just doesn't just doesn't point to a contraction, right? Like, <laughs> but ultimately, yeah, you're right. Because I do. There is a, you know, this is one of the things that's interesting about intimacy, right? That's striking to me is making the family systems. People talk about intimacy being a, a function of your ability to tolerate anxiety. And specifically, a particular kind of anxiety that comes up in relationship. If you say that, like, you know, like a maybe a you and I become intimate, there's bullseyes to that, like, you know, layers and layers and layers, right? And that usually when you get close to a layer is where you you get these moments where I these two fundamental drives to be human is one, I want to like dissolve in everything I call good and have absolute belonging and reassurance that it's going to be there forever, right? And then the other, other one is to, is to stand out in my cosmic uniqueness, right? And 
that's what it is to be human. And then just press go, right? And wonder why. <laughs> um, but in intimacy, it's usually that sense, isn't it? Where, where all of a sudden something, if I'm, there's a moment where I want something that may, that looks like it may threaten our relationship, right? Or, or there's a truth that if I say it, right, you could go away, right? Um, and intimacy is really about, seems to be about those moments where you, you go right to the eye of the needle with that with somebody. And what's so, what's interesting to me, like watching this happen over and over again and working with couples is another thing I do is like work a lot with, you know, couples and coach them and stuff is when when they do in some sense say it right oftentimes what's interesting about this is like they didn't say it because they were almost certain that if they said it x y and z would happen therefore i'm not going to say it right and, and then they had reason not saying it, yes and then not saying it right gets to this point where it hurts too much to not say it then even though X, Y, and Z, and then they say it. And usually the very reason why they didn't say it happens. Some version of it happens, right? And so on one level you can go, well, that's, that justifies me not, you know, not saying it because I knew that that was gonna happen, but because he didn't say it, Right, you're now in. You're now. You never got. In, you're now in territory that you couldn't be otherwise. Yeah. Right, and so now, because you aren't in that territory, now you can start to observe it and be with it and be in the presence of it. Yeah. And and I think in that sense is where it, coming back to trust. What do I trust when I? Say what's true for me, even though I'm afraid that you will go away or something will dissolve or something will go away that I can't feel like I can survive, right? And what am I trusting actually when I say that, right? Because the first level is like oftentimes the very thing I'm afraid of happens. But what's interesting about that is because I do it, I volunteer. And it's not just, you know, especially it's not, it's, it's, it's even more than just volunteer. It's extra duty volunteer because I'm precisely really scared to say it. So volunteering is really, really, it's, it's a real frontal forward stepping, stepping into it, trusting. And there's something about that, that no matter how it, I think I've noticed is that no matter what happens after that, the, the thing that seems to be trustworthy is that it ultimately ends up leading to something that can be very, very transforming, right? Like, and I think there's just that one element that, that because I think a lot of the reasons why we avo avoid vulnerability, right, is because of our experiences of being exposed before. And so if we have that mapped over with vulnerability, right, exposure is that thing where it's like, you know, like someone pulls your pants down or like something suddenly happens and, and you're faced with your like humiliation and you're surprised by it in some way. That's exposure. Right. Well, vulnerability, though, is actually kind of maybe perhaps doing the exact same thing, except for you, you step into it. And so in that sense, it's like the, no matter how it turned, the outcome of that particular situation turns out, the self that one hmm. gets to transcend and become through it, is, I think is the thing, is, is what is trustworthy. Yeah. As far yeah. As I know. Yeah. Well, Peterson gets at that in 12 rules. Um, it's the, it's the voluntary. I mean, the thing about telling the truth, it's the voluntary aspect. It's, it's, 
you know, it's, it's that direction that changes it and, and you can turn the tables on, um, you can turn the tables on the, well, a lot of it has to do with agency. Um, yeah. That, that, that your agency is broadened, not narrowed. Um, no, it's very true. Well, well, guy, we're, we're, we're coming up on two hours here. Yeah. I mean, I could, I could keep going, but I, I know. So could I, or I have a, I have a, another meeting with the, the band is getting back together. Chris and John oh. and Jordan Hall were meeting, I think, at 2.30. So oh, good. For that. Good. Well, thank you for your time. And thank you for, as always, you're a, um, you're a masterful listener mm. and, a, um, and a very, well, a very, uh, a very satisfying conversation partner. Absolutely. Love, love being with you, my friend. And one of these days, what hopefully well, this COVID we'll be, scourge we'll, will pass. We can be each other in the flesh, which would be much absolutely. better. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, guy. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.